Now let's move on and learn the final set of keywords in level 3. Word 41. Adroit. A D R O I T. Skillful. Clever. Dexterous. Specifically, showing skill in using one's hands or in using one's brains. Synonyms of adroit include deft, resourceful, ingenious, artful, and adept. Word 7 of Level 1. Antonyms of adroit include awkward, clumsy, inept, and maladroit. Adroit comes from Latin through the French droit, right, and means literally to the right. Historically, the English language has always favored the right hand as the better, more skillful hand. Yes, I know that's unfair to southpaws, but my job is not to say it ain't so, but to call them like I see them. The fact is, a bias for right-handed words is ingrained in the language, which is one reason we don't say out in right field to mean crazy, weird, unorthodox. Let's take a brief look at some of these handy English words. The Latin dexter means on the right side, skillful. From dexter, we inherit the word dexterous, skilled with the hands or body. Now, here's where things get sinister for lefties. The Latin sinister means left, on the left side, and also wrong, evil, unfavorable, adverse, the meaning of the English word sinister today. People who are ambidextrous are equally skillful or dexterous with both hands. Can you guess what the opposite of ambidextrous is? The unusual word ambisinister means literally having two left hands, equally awkward with both hands. Latin is not the only language that favors righties and disdains lefties. The French gauche, spelled G-A-U-C-H-E, means left, but also crooked, awkward, clumsy. Gauche entered English in the 18th century, and since then it has been used to refer to a person who is awkward, crude, or blundering, or to behavior that lacks culture or social grace. On the other hand, so to speak, from French we have also assimilated the word adroit, done with the right hand, and so skillful, clever, dexterous. Adroit may refer to physical dexterity, but it is also often used of mental ingenuity. For example, you can make an adroit maneuver in a wrestling match or in a game of chess. Adroit also often implies exhibiting either physical or mental dexterity to elude danger or extricate oneself from a difficult situation.
Word 42. Platitude. P L A T I T U D E. A flat, dull, ordinary remark. A trite statement or hackneyed saying. Especially one uttered as if it were original or profound. Phil thought the management seminar was a big waste of time because the instructor kept repeating the same old platitudes he had heard many times before. Platitude comes from the French word for flat and means literally a flat remark. Synonyms of platitude include cliche, truism, and bromide. Platitude also has several useful relatives. The adjective platitudinous refers to speech or expression that is dull, ordinary, commonplace, insipid, banal. The verb to platitudinize means to utter platitudes. And a platitudinarian is a person who habitually utters platitudes, flat, dull, ordinary remarks. In Shakespeare's Hamlet, the character Polonius is considered a platitudinarian. In bidding leave to his son Laertes, the pompous old advisor cannot resist sharing his favorite precepts, among them, neither a borrower nor a lender be, to thine own self be true, and the apparel oft proclaims the man. These and many other expressions from Shakespeare have since become. Platitudes, dull, ordinary statements uttered as if they were still meaningful and fresh. Word 43. Fastidious. F A S T I D I O U S. Extremely delicate, sensitive, or particular, especially in matters of taste or behavior. Dainty, fussy, finicky, over nice. Fastidious table manners, a fastidious dresser, a fastidious worker who agonizes over every detail of the job. Fastidious may also mean hard to please, extremely picky or demanding, exacting, critical to a fault, a fastidious ear for music. Fastidious in one's choice of friends, a fastidious client for whom a good job is never good enough. Fastidious descends from Latin words meaning squeamish, disgusted, disdainful, and conceited. More than a trace of these unpleasant words remains in the way fastidious is used today. The fastidious person is so excessively concerned with details. That he may become squeamish or disgusted if things are not just right. The fastidious person may also be so hard to please, so critical and demanding, that she appears contemptuous of others. According to the Great Century Dictionary, fastidious almost always means a somewhat proud or haughty particularity. A fastidious person is hard to please because he objects to minute points. Or to some point in almost everything. The words scrupulous, meticulous, punctilious, and fastidious all suggest demanding standards and careful attention to every aspect or detail. Scrupulous means having scruples or principles, hence rigorously careful and exact about doing what is correct and proper. City officials called for a scrupulous investigation into the alleged embezzlement of public funds. All employees must follow company regulations scrupulously. Meticulous is often used today to mean painstaking, taking pains to attend to details or exercise care, as in the report showed meticulous research. Or doctors must wash their hands meticulously before examining patients. Meticulous, however, comes through the Latin meticulosus, timid, from metus, fear. 
By derivation, meticulous properly suggests exaggerated attention to details or unimportant matters out of nervousness or timidity. Albert dressed for the interview with meticulous care, all the while reminding himself that making a good first impression was the key to getting the job. Punctilious, spelled P-U-N-C-T-I-L-I-O-U-S, comes from the Latin punctum, a point. From the same Latin punctum comes the English word punctilio, a fine point, nice detail. By derivation, punctilious means exact and often excessive attention to punctilios, to fine points or minute details, especially in observing customs, ceremonies, or procedures. The new executive director seemed to have Robert's rules of order memorized, for she cited chapter and verse as she guided the board through each item on the agenda with a stern and punctilious hand. Fastidious means having extremely delicate, sensitive, or particular tastes. Fussy, picky, or demanding in a condescending way. As Webster's New International Dictionary, 2nd edition, puts it, fastidious suggests a certain disdainfulness in rejecting what is displeasing to one's taste. Word 44. Vendetta. V-E-N-D-E-T-T-A. A bitter, protracted feud or rivalry. Vendetta comes through Italian from the Latin vindicta, revenge, vengeance, the source also of the English word vindictive, vengeful, seeking revenge. The vindictive person feels he has been wronged and is disposed to retaliate. In certain cases, this may lead to a vendetta, a long, bitter, and often violent feud. Vendetta refers specifically to the violent tradition, formerly practiced in Italy, Sicily, and Corsica, of revenging the murder of a relative by killing the murderer or a member of his family. Of course, such private, extra-legal vengeance usually leads to further retaliation until a murderous rivalry ensues. Both in Italian and in English, these protracted blood feuds are known as vendettas. Anyone who's seen the Godfather film trilogy knows that vendettas are still common among the American mafia, and they can last for generations. In English, vendetta may also be used more generally to mean any long, bitter feud or rivalry, not necessarily between families and not necessarily attended by bloodshed. The mayor accused her opponent of waging a vendetta instead of a campaign. At first, Steve was excited about his new managerial position with Eye for an Eye Incorporated but he soon realized that the company was run by backstabbing executives engaged in vicious departmental vendettas. Word 45. Lucid. L-U-C-I-D. Clear. Easy to see or understand. Plainly expressed. Lucid is also commonly used to mean clear of mind, mentally sound, rational, sane. His 90-year-old mother is senile, but she still has some lucid days. Synonyms of lucid in the first sense, clear, easy to understand, include intelligible, 
comprehensible, limpid, and perspicuous. P-E-R-S-P-I-C-U-O-U-S Antonyms include murky, obscure, befuddled, nebulous, word 5 of level 2, ambiguous, word 25 of level 2, and abstruse, A-B-S-T-R-U-S-E, which means complicated, hard to understand. Anything that is clearly understood or plainly expressed can be described as lucid, a lucid explanation, a lucid question, a lucid account of the issues. The unusual but useful word pellucid, spelled P-E-L-L-U-C-I-D, intensifies the meaning of lucid. Pellucid means exceptionally clear, extremely easy to see or understand. Word 46. Salient. S-A-L-I-E-N-T. Conspicuous. Noticeable. Prominent. Sticking or jutting out. Synonyms of salient include protruding, manifest, obtrusive, and protuberant. Antonyms of salient include inconspicuous, unassuming, unobtrusive, indiscernible, and unostentatious. Salient comes from the Latin verb salire, to leap, jump, spring. That which is salient seems to leap out at you, jump into view, or spring forward to command your attention. People often have salient noses or other salient physical features. A salient characteristic is a person's most conspicuous or noticeable characteristic. A salient wit is forceful and prominent. Salient may apply to things that are attractive or unattractive. Salient beauty and salient ugliness are both striking and conspicuous. They leap out at you with equal force. Word 47. Categorical. C-A-T-E-G-O-R-I-C-A-L. Absolute, unqualified, explicit, without exceptions, conditions, or qualifications. Antonyms of categorical include ambiguous, word 25 of level 2, and doubtful, dubious, indefinite, enigmatic, and equivocal. In the philosophy of logic, a categorical proposition affirms something absolutely, without resorting to conditions or hypothesis. In the philosophy of ethics, Immanuel Kant's famous categorical imperative is, as the third edition of the American Heritage Dictionary puts it, an unconditional moral law that applies to all rational beings and is independent of any personal motive or desire. In general usage, categorical refers to statements or assertions that are absolute, unqualified, direct, and explicit. A categorical reply is direct and explicit. A categorical refusal is complete and unconditional. A categorical denial is absolute and unqualified. Although categorical may be used of any utterance that is absolute and unqualified, today it often suggests a statement or state of mind that is rigid, narrow, arrogant, or arbitrary. A categorical decision may seem universal to some, but unfair and arbitrary to others. And when someone calls a creed or opinion categorical, the implication is that some assert that it is absolute, while others believe it is narrow-minded or false. Word 48. Inscrutable. 
I N S C R U T A B L E. Incomprehensible, unfathomable, extremely difficult to understand, not open to investigation or analysis. Synonyms of inscrutable include mysterious, impenetrable, esoteric, and arcane. A R C A N E. Antonyms include lucid, word forty-five of level four, and perspicuous. Inscrutable combines the negative prefix in, which means not, with the Latin scrutari. To examine, inspect, search thoroughly. Scrutari is also the source of the English words scrutinize, to investigate, examine closely, and scrutiny, a close examination. By derivation, inscrutable means incapable of being scrutinized, not able to be examined or investigated. Anything that cannot be fathomed. That does not open itself readily to the understanding may be called inscrutable. Many of the workings of nature are inscrutable, even to biologists. Human nature and the functions of the mind are still inscrutable to psychiatrists and neurologists, and even to philosophers and theologians. The meaning of life is still, and probably always will be, inscrutable. Now for a word of advice on usage. Chances are you've heard "inscrutable" used in the phrase "an inscrutable smile." That's a cliche, a hackneyed expression. Unless you're trying to be humorous, it's best to avoid it altogether. When you use "inscrutable," strive for an original turn of phrase. One other word of caution. In the past, perhaps because of the popularity of the fictional characters Fu Manchu and Charlie Chan. The word "inscrutable" was often applied to Asians or to the Asian race. You should be aware that today this use is considered not only cliché but also derogatory and offensive. Word forty-nine: construe. To interpret, explain the meaning or intention of. Construe comes from the same Latin source as the familiar words construct and construction. One less common meaning of the word construction is an explanation or interpretation. In this sense, to put a construction on something, such as a statement or an action, means to assign a meaning to it, explain its significance or intent. For example, in every case decided by the United States Supreme Court, the role of the justices is to put their particular construction. On how the Constitution shall influence the law of the land. By derivation, the verb to construe means to put a particular construction on something, to interpret it, explain its underlying meaning or intention. Silence is often construed as agreement. An ambiguous reply is difficult to construe. Some men insist on construing that when a woman says no. She really means yes. If your boss asks you why you were late to work three days in a row, while you dream up an excuse, you can buy time by responding, "I'm not sure how to construe your question." Word fifty. Allude. A L L U D E. To refer to something indirectly, make a casual reference. Synonyms of allude include suggest, hint, insinuate, and intimate. I n t i m a t e. Antonyms include indicate, specify, detail, and enumerate. To allude and to refer are synonymous, but differ markedly in usage. To refer is to mention something specifically. Pointed out distinctly, the Declaration of Independence refers to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness as unalienable rights. To allude is to refer to something indirectly or casually, without mentioning it. 
a political candidate might allude that an opponent has a skeleton in the closet. In a report or proposal, you might allude to a study that supports your point without citing it directly. Someone who is afraid of heights might allude to a disturbing childhood experience as the source of the phobia. The corresponding noun is allusion, A-L-L-U-S-I-O-N. An allusion is an indirect, casual, or passing reference. The novel contains many allusions to Shakespeare. Only by allusion did the article suggest that the company was in financial trouble. Bubble. 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 Let's review the ten key words you've just learned. This time, I'm going to give you the review word followed by three words or phrases, and you decide which of those three answer choices comes nearest the meaning of the review word. Are you ready? Let's begin. Is an adroit maneuver skillful, quick, or deceptive? An adroit maneuver is skillful, clever, dexterous. Adroit means showing skill in using one's hands or in using one's brains. Is a platitude a strong opinion, a trite statement, or an embarrassing error? A platitude is a flat, dull, ordinary remark, a trite statement, especially one uttered as if it were original or profound. Is a fastidious person thoughtful and patient, pushy and obnoxious, or fussy and demanding? Fastidious means fussy and demanding, hard to please, finicky, extremely delicate, sensitive, or particular, especially in matters of taste or behavior. Is a vendetta a bitter feud, an official reprimand, or an apology. A vendetta is a bitter, protracted feud or rivalry. Is a lucid remark humorous, clear, or insightful? A lucid remark is clear. Lucid means clear, easy to see or understand, plainly expressed. It may also mean clear of mind, rational, Sane. Does salient mean superior, well-known, or conspicuous? Salient means conspicuous, noticeable, prominent, sticking or jutting out. Is a categorical statement contradictory, argumentative, or absolute? A categorical statement is absolute. Categorical means without exceptions, conditions, or qualifications. Would something inscrutable be irreparable, incomprehensible, or unusual? Something inscrutable is incomprehensible, unfathomable, extremely difficult to understand, not open to investigation or analysis. Does construe mean to assemble, to interpret, or to agree? Construe means to interpret, explain the meaning or intention of. When you allude to something, do you reveal it, run away from it, or refer to it indirectly? When you allude to something, you refer to it indirectly, Make a casual reference to it. That concludes the review for this section and for Level 3. Remember that if you answered fewer than eight of the questions correctly, you should review the keyword discussions for this last section before moving on to Level 4.
Now let's talk about the final stage in the process of vocabulary building, putting your new words into action. What are you going to do with all these new words you are working so hard to learn? I mentioned earlier how words are the tools of thought. They are, in fact, like finely engineered pieces of machinery, in the sense that they are designed to perform a specific function with precision. If a carpenter drives a large nail into a slender piece of wood, the wood will split. So it is with sentences. If a word is too complicated or too simple, if it is forced or awkward, or if its meaning does not fit the context exactly, the sentence becomes faulty and useless, like that split piece of wood. There's an anecdote my family has passed down for generations that illustrates this point. My great grandfather was a dyed in the wool Yankee from Andover, New Hampshire. He divided his time between practicing law, dabbling in state politics, and running a small farm on which he employed from time to time a handyman named George. Well, one day George decided to build himself a new house. So that spring he went to work, sawing and hammering, and by harvest time the dwelling was finished. George invited my great-grandfather over to admire his handiwork. My great-grandfather walked slowly around the place, inspecting everything. Then he stepped back and examined the structure from a distance. Well, what do you think? George asked, worried by my great-grandfather's puzzled expression. George, said my great-grandfather, does that door frame look a bit crooked to you? By golly, it does, now that you mention it. And that window there, it seems to be lower than the one next to it. You know, you're right, George replied. I never noticed that before. And George, look at the roof. Seems to be sagging some, wouldn't you say? The poor handyman had to agree. Well, said my great-grandfather. George was silent for a moment. You know, I can't understand it, he said finally. Them tools was all new. Words are like tools also in the sense that if you care about them, keep them in good working order, and use them conscientiously, they will perform beautifully and never wear out. But if, like George, your tools are all new but you don't know how to use them properly, you are setting yourself up for a few unpleasant surprises. That's the challenge of taking the step from acquiring a new word to using it in your writing and conversation. How and when you use the words you learn will, of course, be your decision and your responsibility but I can offer you some guidelines that will help you put your new vocabulary into action right away and help you enjoy doing it right and doing it well. The first thing you should do with every new word is try it out silently in your mind several times before using it in speech or writing. Say you're in the middle of a telephone conversation and you think of an adroit way to slip in one of the words you've just learned. Great! You're on your way to mastering the word. But wait, don't use it yet. Let it pass this time and make a mental note to check verbal advantage and your dictionary to be sure that your usage and pronunciation were correct. If they were, then the next time you can use the word with assurance. If you didn't get it quite right, listen to the keyword discussion again. Then record the word and the definition on a flashcard and review it until you feel confident you can use it precisely. Sometimes, the hardest part of learning new words is putting them in context. The problem with acquiring a miscellaneous assortment of words is that they tend to remain miscellaneous, floating in the gray matter of your passive vocabulary instead of being catalogued in the proper cubbyhole of your active memory. You need to create a vivid, personal context for each word you learn, and this is where the power of association can help you. Try making a list of a dozen or so new words, and next to each one, write something that particular word brings to mind. Examples might include people you know, places you've been, books you've read, experiences you've had, or some image the word evokes from you. One effective method I have employed in my own vocabulary building is associating a word with the circumstances in which I first encountered it. Where did I read it? Who said it? What was my reaction to the way it sounded or the way it was used? 
By using this method, I have found I can remember where and when I learned a certain word, even as far back as my childhood. Another helpful method is to keep a journal or personal notebook in which, as you record your thoughts and experiences, you occasionally test out some of your new words, and so gain practice with them before putting them to more public use. Here are a few other pragmatic suggestions to help you build confidence in your new vocabulary. Jot down three or four words you want to use on a given day, and on the way to work, imagine a conversation with a coworker in which you use them, or try to incorporate them into a letter or report you have to write. In your office, place your list of new words by the phone, the typewriter, or the computer, so you can refer to it as you conduct your business. Finally, if you encounter a new word in your reading and the passage in which you found it is especially interesting or meaningful to you, you might try memorizing it and quoting it in something you write or at an opportune moment in a meeting. One very important thing you must do with each word you learn is decide if it is better used in writing or in speech, or if you are comfortable using it either way. For example, a word like lacrimose, L-A-C-H-R-Y-M-O-S-E, doesn't occur often in speech and has a literary and somewhat old-fashioned flavor. Therefore, in conversation, tearful, mournful, or even lamentable would be more appropriate. On the other hand, the words lucid and perspicuous can be used either in writing or conversation, where the simpler word clear would not have the same power, precision, or style. In conclusion, let me offer you a few words of advice on what not to do when you put your vocabulary into action. Don't try to use a new word too soon, before you have studied it and tested it repeatedly in your mind. Wait until you feel entirely comfortable with a word. Otherwise, you run the risk of misusing it and embarrassing yourself. Don't use a new word just for the sake of using it. If you suspect that a familiar word may be more appropriate in a given situation, use the familiar word. Be patient, and the time for the new word will come. Also, use restraint. Don't lard your sentences with difficult words simply for the effect. I assure you that this sort of exercise is exciting only for you, never for your listener or reader. Remember that the goal of communication is to be lucid, not inscrutable. Like your wardrobe, your diction doesn't have to be ostentatious to look good. The final and very important don't is don't use your vocabulary to impress people. That's like flashing a wad of bills to show everyone how flush you are. The person who shows off with words only annoys or intimidates others. The big word is not always the better word. Certain words are more appropriate in a given situation than in others. When choosing your words, always consider the intelligence, education, interests, and concerns of the person you are speaking to or the people who will read what you write. That's not to say that you'll never be able to use many of the words you learn. On the contrary, a large vocabulary will make you a more capable and versatile user of the language because you will have a greater selection of words to choose from and a better understanding of how to use them precisely. A powerful vocabulary will help you communicate more effectively with people than ever before, provided you are sensitive to the subtleties of using the right word in the right place at the right time. I assure you that if you continue listening carefully to this program and make a conscious effort to read more and consult your dictionary, using your new vocabulary soon will become as natural as riding a bicycle or tying your shoes.